I'm not quite sure how I managed to end up talking about oral history, but anyway, probably by virtue of having done a couple of oral history projects. But this short paper will look at some of the things to consider when um, we, oral history interviews are used as part of largely archaeological building recording. Um, I don't think any of the things that we should be considering are more, any different to normal, but we perhaps pay less attention to them in the kind of normal process of archiving. So, um, let's say it's, it's things like the kind of rights of the participants, uh, where we're going to archive, what the ethical considerations are. And although it sounds slightly tedious, GDPR and privacy, which is, is quite an important aspect of it. I mean, I mean, buildings obviously are very definitely used by people and people can often tell us quite a lot about them, um, how they were used, their relationship with them and all that kind of thing. But I mean, re and again, realistically, the use of oral history is probably only occasional, um, even if we're recording slightly more modern buildings, then um, you know, they tend to be quite a long way in the distant past. Um, but again, the issues raised have um, wider application. There's a couple of building there where we have done an element of or, or are doing an element of oral history recording. Um, I mean, building recording more often than not involves historical research, sort of local history type of research, um, social history. Um, and when I think of oral history, I always think of the work of George Ewart Evans, who was um, working in the 70s. And I still think his work is relevant to kind of rural, um, rural life and, and buildings. I partly slowly show this slide because I knew the guy showing the horse from my childhood in Suffolk. Um, I think probably that photograph was taken before I was born, but <laughs> I am quite old. But anyway, um, but it's, it's 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 good to know that his memories have been recorded and that they are accessible. Um, the point here is that you can always check what archives ex archive exists before creating more, perhaps. Um, I thought this definition def definition quoted here, written in the 70s on the oral history website, was kind of quite relevant to some of the things we talk about now. Um, I didn't think it quite recommends a selection policy, but the point here is that, you, that really if you're doing oral history, your selection policy probably needs to happen before um, you start doing the interviews. Um, again, the responsibilities of the... Um, oral historian. We need to kind of, you need to think ahead. Um, again, good advice for any type of archive. Um, obviously, there's a lot, lot to do with informed consent. Um, and also what, what the interviewees themselves want to get out of the project. Oral history can do a little more sometimes than just simply add colour to the record. In conversation, people will describe the buildings they worked on, in and lived in, and, and the processes that, that took place there. Um, but mostly they'll talk about their kind of emotional response and, and how they interacted with the building. Um, these are buildings on, a, on an old Royal Ordnance factory now under a housing state. We've got Mary, who was 99 when she was interviewed. Um, she was a uh, worked for the police on the site. Um, she was able to describe the building she worked in and um, recounted her memories of keeping guard on the site, um, the police boxes, how people came in and out of the site, and, and various other aspects of daily life within, within the factory. This is Dorothy. She worked in the, um, the cordite section in the shell painting shed, and one of her jobs was to record the number of large caliber bombs that were placed in the cooling pits. Um, quick whiz through some of the practicalities of oral history of relevance to archiving. I mean, I won't have time to go through them in detail, and you probably won't have to, time to read everything on the, on the slides, but hopefully it will be sufficient to give you an idea of some of the things that we kind of need to consider. Um, I'll point you in the direction of the um, Oral History Society website, where all of this information is quite easily accessible. I mean, obviously we've got ethical duties, and in many cases legal duties. Confidentiality, of course. Um, to protect from disclosing sensitive information, treat people as intelligent beings, may make their own decisions. I mean, again, that, that could be, you know, we are, we are quite often dealing with um, elderly people and, you know, there are kind of a number of ethical issues that need to consider. 
certainly before anyone does any oral history, I'd certainly recommend the training that the Oral History Society do. Um, again, information is important. And again, something kind of resonates to archive, importance to a wider society to make available the information publicly. Um, important documents. Again, thinking ahead comes in here. The interview participation agreement and the interview recording agreement. Um, unless you get these right, you can't kind of archive. Um, you know, you may, there may be kind of legal reasons. And, and again, the importance of um, sensitive data that might need to be kind of embargoed. Or, I mean, and again, people can actually restrict. You know, they have a right if they want if they want to embar embargo part of what they've what they said for a time period. Um, they have a right a right to do that, and it's important that all that is clarified before the archive is, is, goes further through the system. Um, again, GDPR, I won't go into to great detail, but we all know that everything's got to be processed lawfully, the storage, um, accuracy, um, and the legal basis on which we're processing the data. Um, probably with, re certainly with um, relevance to oral history, um, Archiving in the public interest is one of the reasons for processing data, and um, that's the kind of recommended process for if you were doing an oral oral history project. Um, copyright, again, important. Um, oral History Society recommends against a Creative Commons license because there's some conflicts with um, GDPR and data protection. So where to archive? I mean, all the obvious places. Um, some of these places may not actually be able to archive the material to the kind of standard that, that we require. But on the other hand, they might be the places where the archive has most use. So there's perhaps something to, to consider, consider there. Um, the other issue I kind of wanted to touch on as a bit of an aside is whether or not we've got to grips with copyright and reproduction licenses, time limited licenses, um, you know, we all publish stuff in our reports and reproduce stuff. I mean, I'm not an expert on copyright, so, um, you know, in my sort of slightly amateur way, but, you know, I'm not sure that as a group of people we've kind of understood how these things work particularly well. Um, you know, we come up against all sorts of different license agreements. It always strikes me as um, slightly strange that the HER data that we publish in our reports usually is released with a 12-month user license. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether that means that we should, every 12 months, we should renew the license or not. Maybe someone could tell me, I don't know. But again, we just need to be kind of mindful of um, that kind of thing. So I think what else was I going to say? Yeah, the, the, I just thought that was quite interesting because the National Library of Scotland seemed to have updated their um, their copyright for documentary records maps that they create, which is interesting because now they're they're saying that you know you can publish it. So I wasn't sure if people are aware of that. And finally, there are other issues as well um, with the kind of data we we collect. Um, obviously, slightly sort of hesitant to publish the, put the, the slide on the, on the left there because obviously that's from the kind of Urban Explorer website, but sometimes, you know, that's better information than the information we've got now when we record the building. Um, and again, not all information. I mean, that's slightly kind of um, blotted out the kind of rude words, but, you know, we might collate information from a number of sources and not all of, all of it will necessarily comply with our archiving requirements. What do we do with it? Do we archive it or don't we archive it? Um, so just a few kind of quick whiz through of some of the thoughts there that have struck me from doing a couple of oral history projects. 